So hello everyone and thank you for coming. It's great to see a, a full house. Um, we are thrilled to have Dr. Andrea Wenzel here with us. She is an associate professor at Temple University. I um, mean, uh, if the faculty and staff among you have gotten flyers about that, but we have a number of students here. And uh, uh, Dr. Wenzel's uh, expertise is, um, is anti-racism in journalism, which is a great topic. And what she came prepared to talk about today is to talk to um, faculty and staff, but I'm thrilled that these students are here about how do we, when we're educating young professional communicators, journalists, public relations professionals, you know, all, all of you guys, um, how do we move toward teaching you how to be anti-racist in your professional careers? And so we are um, thrilled to have her. She's a visiting scholar here, and um, I'm just going to turn it directly over to Andrea, and um, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you all so much. It's really exciting to be here with all of you. And I'm, I'm hoping this is this is called a, a lunch and learn or brunch and learn. I'm hoping we can kind of learn from each other because I'm excited to learn some of what you all are, are doing and working on as well. Um, so I'm going to share a little bit about the research that I've been doing, the research that I did that I used to um, put together this book, um, but then also talk a little bit about some of the projects I've been trying to weave into my journalism classes and some things that have worked and not worked, um, just in terms of efforts to make journalism more equitable, um, more anti-racist. Um, and then I hope we can have a little time for discussion and talk about things that you might be interested in doing or are already doing and talk about troubleshooting things in that regard. Um, so just to give a little context, some background on me and on where this work is coming from, um, so I should just first state my own positionality, like I have been and continue to be sort of immersed in um, problematic structures and systems myself. I identify as a white cisgender former journalist. I've worked for um, majority white news organizations in the past um, that have exposed me to some pretty problematic ways of doing journalism, but also some really interesting ones too. So I've um, you know, I used to work in public media and then in international media development and along the way um, got in, exposed to some things that I would now would call solutions journalism or engaged journalism um, that didn't necessarily have the words to do so at the time. Um, and from that, when I went into academia and started doing research about journalism, um, it led me to look into projects and try to make a case for more community-centered journalism. Um, which I mean by that journalism that's produced for and with communities that tries to center both community needs and community assets. Um, and as I think about that, so I was focusing on what kinds of relationships community members wanted from local news. Um, and it, in some cases I worked with some, I collaborated with community members to design their own community-centered journalism initiatives. And um, that was great, but they still express challenges that they faced from the narratives being told about their communities by more mainstream news organizations, um, harmful na narratives um, that were being shared. And so that led me to want to explore as part of this project that I'll share a little bit of, with you about, um, how larger news organizations could be less harmful um, and to look at different initiatives to try to make local journalism more equitable across one new system, and that being in Philadelphia. And so in my book, I feature a series of case studies, both of established majority white news organizations like the Philadelphia Inquirer or WHYY, our public radio station, um, but also more community-centered and majority BIPOC journalism organizations as well. Um, and the case studies include examples of um, collaborations that I did with these news organizations um, working on things like source diversity audits with the public radio station, the public media station, um, looking at their newsroom cultures. I also collaborated with the Philadelphia Inquirer and co-led an audit following the publication of this racist headline. Um, and I assessed, we did, we did um, kind of tracked and followed what they did in response, the different, different DEI initiatives that they did that followed. Um, and I won't go into like the weeds of the whole thing. I'll, I'm going to do a more conversation about the book later on today. Um, but the book kind of shares analysis of what was and was not effective in these organizations and the need for accountability infrastructure to have really meaningful transformation of these news organizations. 
um, to kind of get beyond just doing like a one-off project that could be performative or, or not sustainable. Um, and when I talk about accountability infrastructure, I, it's, you know, it basically just mean new systems, structures, or programs that facilitate holding stakeholders with more power accountable to those with less. Um, and in this, in this series of case studies, I also looked at two startups where more than half of their staff identified as BIPOC and the organizations weren't stuck doing just repair work. They were able to sort of reimagine what's possible with local journalism. Um, and sort of use those as a way to explore some other issues. Um, so I, without kind of going into much depth, I'll just share a little briefly about the, the recommendations that I came up with for this, um, through this process of looking at these cases. Um, so you know, one of them was to just try to standardize community-centered journalism processes as just good journalism. Um, a lot of times the kind of strategies that use community organizing principles, ways of kind of building relationships with communities would get siloed off in a news organization to be just the engagement person or just the community outreach person, if they were so lucky as to have such a person. Um, but just trying to make that more of just a normal part of doing reporting was one recommendation. Also thinking about how is to create different kinds of internal accountability infrastructures within the organization for equitable journalism. So this might be things like tracking the, um, who you're talking to for your stories, doing source monitoring or source tracking, um, organizing different kinds of forums to talk with community members after you do a story to get feedback and input, and then thinking about how to hold staff members accountable for the work they do by having performance review metrics about how they do this sort of work. Um, and just to kind of give a picture of how I think about this as sort of part of a cycle of doing community-centered journalism, and these, some of these different kinds of accountability infrastructure can map onto that cycle. Um, you know, without going into the details of all of them, it's, um, you know, there's different things you can do at the point of, of getting your story ideas and listening to communities and building relationships at that part of the cycle. Thinking about then also then once you're doing the reporting, how you can kind of create some structures to hold yourself accountable as you do that. And then at the point of editing, it's incredibly important as well. Um, you know, a lot of reporters get frustrated when they think they've done their very best to kind of develop relationships with, with communities, but then they face troubles in the editing process of feeling that their editors are maybe expecting them to explain a story for an assumed and imagined white audience that may or may not be the case, um, and it's, it ends up getting kind of messed up at that point in the process. And then likewise, once you have your story, making sure you're thinking about how to you know, meet people where they are to distribute it and to kind of have you know, relationships over time with, with the communities that you're trying to report for and with. Um, and then finally, some other recommendations, which I'll probably talk about <coughs> excuse me, more later today if anybody sticks around for that, um, thinking about how to try to incentivize conversations around um, holding the governance of news organizations accountable um, and thinking about you know, who's at the top of these organizations and different ways to hold them accountable and supporting also external accountability infrastructure, so people on the outside who might be trying to hold journalism to account, which might be a community group, it might be um, a group of journalists that are trying to hold a news organization accountable. Um, it can be a variety of things. Um, and then thinking about things like how to make collaborations um, aware of power dynamics and equitable in that way. And thinking about funding, um, how to, to shift how we consider um, how foundations, which is only you know, part of the journalism funding question, how they think about who they're funding and how they're allocating funding and being mindful that so far they have not done a lot to prioritize um, black and brown run and owned um, and centered news organizations. Um, and so what I wanted to focus on mostly today though is thinking about journalism education and as one of the recommendations was to think about how in journalism education there's a lot of work we can do to um, prevent the need to repair things. If, if people who are starting out in journalism are already starting out um, you know, with, with practices that are more equitable, with practices that build relationships with communities, then, then we don't have to do all of that um, repair work. Um, and so that's something that I think is really an exciting thing to be thinking about. Um, and there's a, an opportunity to create more accessible and inclusive journalism training. 
and to try to redefine standards of what good journalism is and defining it as inherently community-centered and anti-racist and equitable. Um, and so I was to share a couple of l examples of some projects that I've been able to try and collaborate with people on in, in my, own, um, my own teaching um, and you know, projects I've done with community members. Um, so f the first one is after the, I was working on this book um, to try to think about what could accountability, how, how to hold student journalism accountable was one question I had. So we have um, a number of different student media operations at Temple and also classes that aim to cover the neighborhoods around our university. Um, and often there's a challenge because the students will leave after a short period of time um, or there's just not, it's hard to build relationships and sustain them with these communities. And there's a lot of distrust of our university um, in some of these communities. And so the, um, we did a project where we tried to look into like what could an accountability relationship be. We did a number of, I did like research focus groups and conversations with people. Um, and then through the process of that, I connected with um, an organization called Day One, Not Day Two. Um, and the community organizer, who's also an artist, um, a hip hop artist, and uh, he does like training for youth in, in different like music and narrative change. Um, he wanted to collaborate on, he's like, why don't we co-teach a class and have um, community members take the class alongside with Temple students? And I was like, funny you should say that. Like a, a few years back, I had done a fairly similar class in a different neighborhood of Philly um, with my, at the time, colleague, Mark Lamont Hill. And we did um, kind of students co-reported solutions journalism stories about their neighborhoods, um, or with the community fellows about their neighborhoods. Um, and so they did this, the community fellows were paid. Um, they, there was sort of this two-way learning that could take place um, where the community fellows didn't necessarily have a journalism background or none of them really had journalism backgrounds. Um, the students were mostly journalism students, but they didn't necessarily know the community very well. Um, and so there was an opportunity for them to learn from each other. Um, and there was an opportunity for them to kind of get feedback very quickly on a story that maybe they thought, oh, this is a great story, and the community members were like, you know, we, no, it's, <laughs> it's not, it's kind of missing, it's kind of off, it's not really um, accounting for this, this, you know, this thing that you didn't really think about in our community, or, or this person is seen as in this way in our community. And so it was an opportunity to, to kind of do it, just do the work a little bit differently. Um, but it was also really hard, <laughs> and um, there's managing expectations between both the, um, the students and the community members was challenging because they didn't necessarily always have the same expectations, um, and just, you know, even just like how work gets done and the timing of things and just the structure of the class could be challenging. Um, all that said, I think, I mean, we're going to teach it again in the fall, and so hopefully learn from, from our mistakes. Um, the other, another example of trying to incorporate some of what I was learning from my research into classes um, was in a, a class where it was a concepts class. So we weren't doing reporting in the class. It was more like learning about journalism concepts with master's students. And we decided to do sort of a mini audit of the Temple News, which is our um, kind of flagship um, print and online newspaper. Um, and so we, we looked and we did sort of a um, we looked at a two-week period of coverage. Um, the students did kind of, they, they looked into the content, did an analysis of it. Um, we made like Google Forms to track to each story. Um, and we looked at a range of different questions about the, about the, the content, looking at both you know, things like who are the sources, who are the people in the stories, what are their backgrounds, um, and like what ways are they being featured in the stories? Are they being featured as experts? Are they being featured as you know, people where things were happening to them? Um, what kinds of, at the story level, asking questions about sort of what is the, the framing or the valence of the stories? Are they solutions oriented or not? Um, are the stories always about the university campus or are they about the community? Um, so they, look, they had a series, we, we, we designed the, um, the, like what we were going to look at after having a conversation with the, the, temp, the, the editor and the advisor to kind of get feedback on what they were working on, what kinds of issues that they wanted to 
to kind of improve on, what kinds of things they thought they were, and how, how they saw themselves, and we kind of use that to then say, okay, let's, how can we kind of look at this and see how it's going? Um, and so, this is just, these are just some slides from the examples of sort of what some of the questions they would answer about each question. Um, one of the things, the biggest issues that they had was uh, wanting, to, they wanted to do more to connect with the North Philadelphia community that they were situated in. Um, they knew that they had some problems there. And so one of the things we wanted to check is so, you know, how, how's that going? <laughs> are, are, you, um, are you, how often are you featuring stories that aren't just about campus things? Um, we also wanted to look at how often they were doing stories that were kind of more solutions oriented versus sort of episodic one-off things or that were more problem centered. Um, and we also looked at like positivity and negativity, even though like in a traditional solutions journalism framework, you're not necessarily thinking about just like a good news story, but when in conversations with community members, people cared about good news stories too. <laughs> they cared about wanting to have positive stories. And so we wanted to look at that. Um, and then we also looked at things like inclusive language and we drew on, um, I think I have an ex maybe a slide in here later, um, some different ways of, of, sort of looking at things like person-centered language, um, looking at framing, um, you know, and there are some kind of basic things like, is it a single source story? Um, is that single source a police officer, a campus administrator, or an official? Um, so, you know, some things that they, you know, didn't want to be doing, but wanted to kind of check and see how's that going. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, the vast majority of the stories were um, primarily centered on campus issues, including campus voices. And so um, we also decided to, to take some examples and share them with community members and get feedback from community members. And so did some like a focus group with with folks and you know and this we use this story as an example um, and got got feedback on how they the concerns that they had with it um, and just particularly uh, in this area one of the big issues is, is development um, and the development that the university is doing in the neighboring area and the, and how like how it's affecting community members how it's affecting gentrification and displacement and things like that and so we did all this, we shared it back, and we're now sort of in the process of, of we're, so this happened over the course of one semester, and then we're now kind of still, I'm still working, I and a couple of students, and some of the community members are kind of working with the Temple News to figure out what to do, what to do next in response. We gave them some recommendations about community engagement opportunities, and hopefully there's gonna be a collaboration between Temple News and the day one, not day two organizations so that they can kind of try to build on what they, what they started there. Um, so that's just one example. Um, you know, for those of you who are educators, I just wanted to also you know note that there's there's a lot of really great things going on. Probably I know many of you are already involved in them, um, including um, Sue Robinson has a great journalism educators collaborative. I hope I'm not getting that wrong. Um, that I can, if anyone is interested, she has a bunch of curriculum resources that she shares uh, about trying to make journalism more equitable and more centering care in journalism. Um, there's, you know, we did a, a, a pre-conference at AJMC with this Engaged Journalism Exchange Project. I collaborate with Jake Nelson, who's at Utah now, um, and just brought together people who are trying to think about this work and who are doing a lot of really amazing things all around the country. Um, so it's, 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 it can be challenging to think about how to reimagine ourselves sometimes. So just, it's great to be able to look out to, to allies everywhere, including folks in this room, so um, just wanted to note that. So that's that's sort of what I was gonna share in terms of um, some background on the, the research I've been doing and how it connects with the, the different kinds of pedagogical experiments I've been involved in. But I wanted to do two things. I wanted to see if anybody has questions, but then I also wanted to um, have a chance to hear about some things that you might be doing or interested in doing. So maybe I'll I'll see if you have questions first, if that's okay. If anybody does. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we're in a social justice advocacy class right now. Cool. And all of this experience where we're like pushed to cope with one of the issues on school. Um, but it's a class where we kind of get to hear creative values and like, where, how important do you think it is for something like this to be required for 
all students that are doing journalism and pursuing that so that they can get that perspective. Because our class is pretty small compared to, you know, all the yeah. students. So how important do you think it is to be like a required thing for everyone to kind of go through? I think that's a great question. I, I, I kind of, it, I kind of wish it was just social justice journalism was just journalism. Like if we could just the whole thing could shift. <laughs> um, I absolutely think I have this challenge when I'm when I'm working with students that they might get a class where we do some of this kinds of work, juniors, seniors, and they they haven't necessarily been exposed to some of these things before. I think that's a problem. I think that there's ways that we can integrate this work into the curriculum early on, or maybe it should be at a separate required class. I think either way. Um, I think we, as educators, need to look for opportunities to just weave this stuff in um, because it, it should just, all journalism should be trying to decenter whiteness. It should all be trying to think about equity questions, thinking about social justice questions. Um, and I, I know that that's not a universally shared view, maybe, but I think that um, there's, there's ways of, without redoing your entire curriculum, that that can be done by just weaving things in, weaving modules into existing classes. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenge, I think, that's shared in a lot of journalism schools. Yeah. Were there any suggestions that you gave specifically to the student newsroom that maybe were different from the ones you gave professional journalists, or did the same suggestions apply there, too? I think the biggest challenge that was kind of a student journalism centered challenge is just the problem of turnover um which is not i mean which is a challenge in professional journalism too but like where you have students who will be there and they'll start to build relationships with communities and then they go <laughs> and it's like you know we've in some instances like some student newsrooms will be like 100 percent turnover and others it might be there's you know it's a it's a separate it's not a class and it's not quite that but it's still pretty frequent um, and so in that case, my recommendations were like, how can you create an ongoing relationship, whether that's like have an ongoing, um, you know, like a standing community advisory group or, or ideally like have, if it's an organization that has a board, like if it's a student news organization, can it have a, a board with community members on it that have oversight of it in some ways? Um, so I, I think like just figuring out whatever Every situation is going to be different, but having some way of having an ongoing relationship with with community members over time, so that you know, even if there's new students, there will be the people who are consistent. Good questions here. Yeah. Um, what was the student union's response to the audit that you did, and what was their reaction, and how did they move forward with it? Well, that's that's in work in progress. <laughs> So, so far I've only talked with like the editor who's been, you know, really positive. I mean, there's a student, um, and, but we're supposed to meet like in a week. So <laughs> wish me luck. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can't really answer. I'm, I'm hopeful because I know they, they're, they're interested in working on this stuff, but it can be like we're, we're, we're still actually, we need to meet to figure out how to like share kind of critical home truths in a way that is not going to put people on the defensive entirely. It's the same thing as with like the professional news audits. It's like, how do you get people to see themselves as part of the solution to the problems? And so hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do that. Yeah. yeah. So have you reached out to the professional organizations? But one of the things you were talking about is editing, right? So editing, I think, is a really important thing. You have a lot of places that it's professional that have editors who can benefit from this. Mm -hmm. So what is that scope, or what is the plans to share those with the editors who are not out of school, who have been out of school for a long time, but need to understand this shift, dynamic shift, what they need to be doing to reach their audience? That's a great question. I mean, I in my work, I've worked with like particular news organizations, and so I've worked with the editors in those news organizations to some extent, like as part of the research process, and then as part of the like sharing what we learned process. You know, my ability to implement something, you know, is limited, right? Because like I'm just an outside researcher. I can't like mandate they do something. In cases where I've had a really good working relationship with the sort of senior people. Um, at the public radio station I used to have, there used to be a vice president there who was, we had a really good relationship and so we would kind of 
talk about how to like like strategies for how to to change things and how to work with editors and and she you know tried to implement a lot of things but then she left and so that's why there's like a structural problem there right but but I'm curious like what um, organizations like what would you recommend like what organizations do you think would be do you have things in mind like well I mean you know I come from a newspaper background so yeah. I think um, I think the, the leadership of newspapers and I think it's always good to start small like the Philadelphia Inquirer is going to be what it is because it's been like that forever but you know there's all these small papers in and around where you are in Philadelphia it's a good place to go because you have younger people who are younger editors, or sometimes you have long-time editors who are teaching younger people how to do this so they can move up. So I think there's a lot to be said about, because they're, they're more focused on community journalism when you're in a small mm -hmm. paper, you know, the Lock Haven paper, for example. I can't remember all the various papers there are in Pennsylvania. They seem as like a good spot because they they don't have as many people in the upper echelon moving around as much because if you're an editor, they were like that usually stay. And they could be more uh, adapting of this kind of language and then we kind of further help the young people who move to the bigger papers as they move along. So, you know, the BM a very large newspaper is it's hard to kind of make a dent. So, you know, you have to start in the, the underground. Yeah, no, I think that's a really great point. I think one of the challenges has been is one element, and I get into this a little bit in my, my book, but like one of the kind of, um, one avenue to incentivize this work is like philanthropic, like kind of these, you know, third party folks who are like journalism support organizations who might have some funding. So it's like, okay, we want this funding. And so we're gonna do this DEI thing because we think it'll help us get funding or, which is problematic, but like, it gets them in the door. Um, and so there's there's some of that, some of these smaller news organizations may or may not have that on their radar um, or may or may not. I mean, I th think that there's a good question there of like how to create more opportunities for that to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but some of these organizations are like, oh, we're so, are we, we have no resources, we don't have time to do anything. So it's like, how do you find a way to make people see this is not an extra thing, that this is just part of doing their job right, and if they want to survive, they need to do this. Um, and that's sort of where there's like a, it's like a, there has to be a step there that I, I mean, I think I would like to think more about, but I think deserves more thought. So I think that's a great question. Yeah, I think state newspapers decide that they give out awards. You usually have a large audience. Yeah. And they have sessions during those things and be a starting point, because they're usually That's, that's interesting. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Awards are another thing that I, I could ramble on about how much I hate awards, but <laughs> and how I think that awards should be there should be requirements for even applying for awards. That could be a way of like like you have to fill out the, the survey that nobody fills out. That I mean, there, there's so many things that are wrong with awards, but. Um, but I won't ramble on about that. I <laughs> Any other questions? I actually was going to suggest, and I know this is like, I originally thought like. I didn't realize there's gonna be a mix of students and professors, but I was gonna ask you all to like, you know, brainstorm for a minute about like what things you're already doing or might wanna to do to rethink journalism education. But I think it's even more cool to do that with students. If, if you're up, um, let's see, how are we doing on time? Um, all right, Kaiser. I have, well, I have yeah. Have more questions. Yeah. Could you, from an instructional standpoint, speak to some of the limitations that you've encountered as you've tried to bring this to the classroom? Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, so some of the things are resources. So like the, the project where we have community fellows, we're paying them. Um, so I had, a, I had a grant for kind of something slightly different that I was able to kind of make it work for that. Um, but if I had not had that grant, it would have been hard to figure out how to pay these community members. And I think that it's important to pay them um, in that instance. Um, I, so resources can be challenging. Um, there has to be, you know, I, I work in a place where there's political will for this kind of work, and that's not the case everywhere. Um, and so that's, that's another thing. Um, that's a very real challenge for a lot of my colleagues, increasingly so. Um, but 
I think there are ways of creatively approaching that. Hopefully, I don't know. I'm a, I don't think I, I, I can't, I have, I shouldn't try to like speak to that because I, I don't have the, 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 the knowledge of, of like what they're, how they're doing that. But I hope there are ways to creatively just talk about how do we just do good journalism and doing good journalism should mean representing the entire communities that we are supposed to be doing good journalism for. Um, and we should be thinking about who's in the room as we do that work. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, there's probably other, I mean, there's also curricular questions, right? And just thinking about um, where things go in the curriculum and how to make these things not just something that they get at the end of their, their time with us so that they're having to unlearn stuff already. Um, basically, it's like how, I, and I talk to people, like practitioners who are, when I talk to them, like, I said, what do you want? Like, what would be helpful? What are you seeing from new graduates? And they're just like, you know, we don't want people to be having to unlearn stuff, um, like coming in with a very narrow, traditional idea of objectivity um, that's not, that's, you know, not nuanced or, you know, that, that can be kind of a problematic um, thing. Um, so if, if the more we can do to like prevent people from having to, to unlearn the problematic stuff, um, the better. I don't know if that's answering your question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm also, also interested in those initial community student conversations, community member student conversations, because you mentioned, you know, different expectations and different like, perceptions of what journalism is. And uh, I'm curious how you facilitated that or if it was a challenging thing to facilitate yeah, I mean, it. so it was a lot of trust building within the room, right? So we had a lot of community members who didn't necessarily have a lot of trust for journalism <laughs> and um, didn't have a lot of trust for Temple University. Um, Temple University is, um, it's like located in a neighborhood that it's a, a majority black, majority Latinx labor-hood, neighborhood, neighborhood, um, where there's been a lot of disinvestment and Temple is seen as sort of like the big gentrifier and like the big, or the big like, you know, buying up land and like displacing people and people feeling like that university is for others, like kids from the suburbs or like it's, it's not some place where we can afford to send our kids, um, even though it's pretty reasonable compared to a lot of places. Um, and so there's this long history of distrust and mistrust and um, so there has to be trust building in the room is one thing. And then once we kind of do that, and, and, and I was collaborating with, I was co-teaching this with um, a community organizer who does not come from a journalism background. So between us, we're like learning at the same time. You know, we're learning from each other. Um, and we tried to model that. Like there'd be times when like, I'd be like, oh, I feel so like, like a normie journalist right now. <laughs> you know, like it's is um, really valuable experience to be able to do that. Um, but, but yeah, so we, we did a lot of, like, we started each class with a check-in, like, we'd go around the room and just share, people share how they're feeling, like, just kind of trying to respect people as, like, full humans in the class, um, and, you know, it was, it just, things took longer, um, and there was different expectations for, like, what to prioritize in, in work, and, like, the community members weren't necessarily caring about grades, um, <laughs> And so, like, just and deadlines, you know, it's like they were, a number of them had other things going on in their lives, you know, so it was, there's just a lot of logistical challenges as well, so, you know. But, it, and, you know, it, it was, it's, I think, still worth it. I think it's maybe, you know, it's, it's a gamble for your SFFs, for your feedback evaluation, like the student feedback. Like, some of them would be like, this was the best class ever, and some people would be like, this was, you know, this would change everything, you know. <laughs> It, it was quite very, it was a lot of like expectation management along the way, so. Any other questions? Okay, yeah. Yes, I do. Uh, so, many of our students will not work in traditional newsrooms, and I really am intrigued by this collaboration that you had with the, uh, the advocacy organization, because I think a lot of this work is going to come not just in a newsroom, but in the public relations community and mm. collaboration. Can you talk a little bit about the different challenges between those two audiences and, and how we might work together? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know as much about like the, the 
like public relations, but in terms of like community organization and and like the, the journalism approach, um, you know, I, I think probably you are all familiar with with journalists being wary of seen as having an agenda and seen as having like a doing advocacy, like advocacy journalism for a long time has had sort of a very negative association amongst many people doing journalism. Um, and I, and there's, I won't try to do justice to a conversation about objectivity, but suffice to say, I don't really buy it. <laughs> um, but I mean, it's, it's been, it, I would argue that historically the way people have interpreted objectivity has been really harmful and, um, you know, had the effect of overrepresenting people who have positions of power, who are mostly white and male. Um, and so there's, um, you know, there's a, there's, within journalism, there's not like one view of how journalism should be. Um, but there's one of the things that even journalists who are fairly critical and reflexive are still often wary of not being independent and, um, working directly with a community organization is seen as a no-go for many people in a traditional journalism space. Um, and so kind of setting that down and be like, okay, let's, let's try. <laughs> um, on the other side, you know, there's from community organizations, um, a lot of people, including um, my colleague Andre Sims, who I worked with on this, um, you know, came from a feeling that their community had been harmed by journalism that they'd been, you know, stigmatized, that they only experienced journalists and, and people in media on the worst day of their lives when there were, you know, a terrible fire or, you know, a, a, a shooting or something awful happened in their community. And so, you know, not a lot of trust towards journalism. Um, and so figuring out, okay, what, what are, do we have any values that are common? And so that, like one of the things we do in that class is like we like think about our values and like we do an exercise where we like put them on like a paper plate and put it on the ground and like look at what are all our different values and how do we think about those. But are there things that we have as shared goals of, um, you know, providing our community information, of um, connecting people to have conversations about issues in the community? Like what, what are the kind of shared areas of concern, shared areas of, you know, things that we can have a shared goal? Um, and it, there's lots of those. Um, and, you know, it's, if you can kind of put the, um, the, perf the, you can't, you don't really put it aside, but you like, you, you still carry it with you, these like different ways of seeing things. But if you can kind of find a way of, of, of setting some shared goals, um, then I think that can be a really fruitful collaboration. And I think it's going to be a necessity <laughs> Because I don't think, um, when, we, when I would talk to community members, they were not going to be reading the Philadelphia Inquirer anytime soon, ever, probably. Um, they weren't, it wasn't really a matter of them coming back to a lot of these news organizations because they never really saw themselves in these organizations in the first place as being well represented. Um, so they didn't really want traditional journalism necessarily anymore. So um, I think how people get their information, how people get local news is going to keep changing. And so one opportunity journalists can look into is how to collaborate with people who already have trust, already have connections with communities um, and seeing if there are ways to like, for mutual benefit um, collaborating in a way that they're mindful of the power dynamics and they're mindful of, you know, not just sort of extracting from the community or extracting from the community organization. Um, I'm not sure that really answered your question. <laughs> um, any other questions? I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I have somewhat of a comment slash question. So first of all, you're doing amazing work. Thank um, you. One in my class, you know, to, to see and um, actually have these conversations because they are doing this work. Several of them are planning to work in traditional newsrooms. Some are not, some are on the fence. Um, so, of course, we are teaching a generation of students who are really, really rethinking what this looks like. Um, but one of my biggest critiques of our field, um, one of the reasons why I came from the newsroom into the classroom was I wanted to get to people earlier. I wanted to get to them sooner, right? Because um, that first year or two in journalism is like really kind of foundational for a lot of what they will learn and, of course, even their education. But 
when I, when, as I continue to do research and I continue to do my teaching and I worked in newsrooms and done all of those things, one of my biggest critiques was, it's not necessarily the newsroom, meaning what I mean by that is that it's not always just, it is the culture of the newsroom, but one of my biggest critiques has been, it starts in the classroom, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of us as educators, um, we come from these backgrounds, we worked in you know, traditional newsrooms, but we ourselves have a lot of those traditions and those norms and those practices embedded in who we are. So now we're teaching the newer generation and then we are putting that on you, right? Because that's a lot of what shapes what you do. But then, how do we get, this is kind of like a comment and a question, something that I continue to kind of wrestle with a little bit, wrestle with, um, is how do we get the buy-in from other educators, right? Mm -hmm. Because we are quick to tell newsrooms, and I think it's, it's really great, but if we're doing this, but we're still coming from the old playbook ourselves, and I'm not saying everyone, y'all, but I'm saying just in terms of what I have seen as like an overarching theme, is if we're still teaching from the same levels of objectivity uh, or other norms and practices, then we have like, a minority of people who are saying social justice journalism should be journalism, right? Or community-centered journalism should be journalism. There, we are few. And then for the most part, I would say overarching thing would be a lot of people still see the traditional way yeah. as the way. So how can we, as the few, right? Um, continue to, you know, make our mark, not just with our students, but even amongst the institution of education. Yes. I know, I know, and, I know, <laughs> and I know you're not like, oh, okay, I'm just one quick answer, but it's just something that I continue to like, I write yeah. about it, I think about it, and then I say, huh. Yeah. You know. Thank you for thinking about it. I would love to know more about your ideas for that. I mean, I think that is a really big issue <laughs> and definitely one that I share at my institution. And I have been, um, our department, like our, we have, a, we have a, a school and then a journalism department and we've experienced a lot of change. Um, and I think there's probably more people on the full-time faculty now who are critical of objectivity, who are thinking about some, who are open to this work not maybe not being the center center of their own research or their own like a whole course but are open to this sort of thing coming into their courses in, in various ways but we also have adjuncts who might be teaching some introduction classes that we don't know um like i don't know what they're they are somewhere i i, I was having a conversation with a colleague the other day because like i went to I was sitting in on someone else's class observing something and one of the students was talking about objective, like a very uncritical um, comment about objectivity. I'm like, I wonder where they're getting that from. And like, so we're trying to amongst ourselves figure out like where they're getting this. And some people are like, oh, they're getting it from their high school. And other people are like, they're getting it from the adjunct teaching the, you know, <laughs> intro, whatever class. And so one of the things that we've talked about maybe trying to do is like, can we do some like teach-ins amongst ourselves? Um, Media 2070, I'm sure you know Media 2070, like they're doing, um, they're, it's a initiative, Free Press and a number of other folks um, back in, I think 2020 started it. They made a really amazing essay looking at sort of the history of harm in journalism and kind of imagining what a reparative journalism could look like. Um, but they have, they're starting to do more like resources around teaching and um, they're eager to reach out to different faculty and collaborate on things like a teach-in. So we might try to do a teach-in with faculty with Media 2070. Um, you know, I have not figured out the answer to this question. <laughs> I think, you know, we should just all try to support each other. <laughs> um, but it's, um, it's a real, it's a real thing. Um, and that's so not satisfying to say that, but but yeah, I mean, I think like, I don't know, do you have any, like, are there things that you're trying? I mean, this might also not be a appropriate venue for this conversation, but. Uh, no, I mean, <laughs> I, I definitely think, 
Um, so when I first moved into grad school, it was like a huge awakening for me. Um, I, I was used to people kind of giving these recommendations, but when I started like listening to the recommendations from some scholars, I was like, wait, what? Like, do you really truly understand like deadline pressures, like yeah. what it's like to be in a newsroom grinding to get stories on? You're not thinking, oh my goodness, you know, whatever, yeah. whatever. Like you're thinking like breaking news, get out the door, right? Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I thought about was, I think a lot of people, <laughs> And, and I'm not saying that this is UGA. I'm yeah. just saying that this is just because I've been in several different spaces where even at AEJ or ICA, like you have these groups of people doing certain types of work and it's, or journals, right? Like there's just so many different things that I, that I look at and I go, well, it's still very segregated. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just the way. So some of my suggestions are one of which is that it is not a recommendation. It is embedded. Mm -hmm. But in the times that we're in, a lot of people are even afraid to do DEI work yep. or to even say that they are purposefully doing things to be anti-racist because they feel like they, they will be singled out and rightfully so in a lot of ways, right? Like it's, it's a concern for educators that I don't think that, you know, of course students would think about. But um, I think one of the things is, is not just making recommendations, making it the mark. Mm -hmm. You know, and these, you know, but, it, but, it, but again, it gets a little harder because now, you know, everyone wants to kind of shy away from it. So then we have to kind of do it underhanded. Um, but I think making, making sure that these conversations are like in the intro classes, but not just the adjuncts, but again, with the conversations with everyone. Yeah. Like when students are pitching certain stories, um, it, a lot of it even comes with how we look at what they're pitching. Yeah. You know, I've even had students tell me, I've, I've, you know, tell me before in different spaces, I've been told this wasn't a story. And I'm like, this is definitely a story. But I think that that is a reflection of the lens in which we yeah. come to this. So some of this, I think it's just really truly embedded in like us as humans. But then on the other part, I think it is a conversation that we can't just underhandedly have, you know, every once in a while it's a conversation that has to be at the forefront all the time um and it doesn't have to just be race because i know so many people are afraid to even say race right yeah. gender inclusivity in terms of ableism yep. ages like it goes across so many different um platforms but i have other suggestions and things but i feel like i'm taking up time and we could probably talk later <laughs> yeah no that's super so great um yeah it made me think of I don't know, like, we don't have a lot of, like, courses about teaching editing, like, for editor, you know, I feel like, because it's often, and this is probably one of the problems, uh, this is like a longer digression, but, I mean, I think a lot of editors come up as former reporters, and they're not necessarily even getting a lot of formal training in what it means to be a good editor, but I think so many of the problematic um, things come in at that level in terms of, not asking questions of yourself and like who you're centering in a story or assuming like who you're assuming the story is for and who has to explain what to whom and so like i feel like i wonder if there's more we could be doing in our education um for thinking about that sort of point in the cycle i don't know that's just a that's just an aside um i think i don't know i was gonna do a little parent chair or like a small group conversation, but I don't know if we, I don't know if we have time. This is a, yeah, yeah. So I guess like if anybody else has questions or thoughts or what, is anybody working on anything or have an idea for something you'd like to see here? Um, I'm curious to know. Anybody working or anybody have like, if you could like dream up a, a project for UGA. Um, or is there something that you're already doing in your social justice journalism class that you want to share a little bit about, or I don't know. Y'all should talk about some of y'all story ideas. Yeah. <laughs> Put them on the spot. I did mine on um, terrorism, and just like the discrimination of like black women actually here mm. in the workplace. I know even with being a reporter on TV, there's a lot of like journalists that can't or shouldn't or don't can't wait for them to their own TV. And accepted, and um, I kind of I chose the story just because kind of growing up, my mom would say like when she 
t-shirt in your hair for this and mm. you put your hair spray or you know so we get our hair straightened a lot and it was and that happens with just a lot of my friends like it's something that it, it, it just happens and it's kind of normalized unfortunately to have to change how you do your hair and things like that so that's kind of what I did my story and I interviewed a couple girls on campus and one of our hair rhythm professors on campus wanted to get her perspective on it um, and I like how it turned out we haven't had braids since then sounds like an A <laughs> Very cool. Thanks for sharing, yeah. Um, I did my story on a proposed bill that's in the state legislature right now that would take criminal history questions off of like public school applications in Georgia. And it's just, I've kind of been, for the better part of the last year, working on different stories about higher education and prisons and access to, to formerly incarcerated individuals. And it's just been really interesting to see kind of the development Cool. That's a hugely important area to be looking at. So, very cool. Thank you for sharing. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, I mean, I don't know if there's one answer to that. I think, um, so one thing that we did for this project was we did a few like listening sessions with community members where we just invited different, I and mean, it, was, it, was like, it was open to whoever, but we also just like invited people from different organizations and um, like set up at like a rec center. Um, and just talk to people about what issues they cared about and brought the student journalists in to talk with them. And they sort of just brainstormed a bit about, um, you know, issues that they would like to see covered more and, you know, hearing feedback on perspectives. They also looked at some examples of stories and kind of critiqued them. Um, so if there's any opportunities to kind of informally, like, you know, organize conversations about that or, or um, I mean, just community engagement work allows you to do that in different ways, right? So you can, um, even things as simple as like tabling or um, just kind of showing up at community meetings not to do a story but just to try to understand what the community cares about and understand sort of what are the issues that are on their minds and how they're talking about them. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can go about that that can allow you as a student journalist to understand things a little better. Um, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting to kind of, you know, imagine beyond what that might be if, if it's something more like connecting people in a bigger group, or I don't know. I think there's a lot of different opportunities depending on your situation. Um, and does that answer your question? Yeah. Do you think that it should be part of the institution's responsibility to give students with these resources an opportunity to connect with local communities? Because as a student, sometimes it can be hard to figure out where to start on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's totally fair. <laughs> um, I, you know, yes, ideally, I think that would be helpful. Um, and I think a lot of journalists, professional journalists, also don't know where to start, right? So, I mean, there's some things that you can do as an individual, and there's other things that would be ideally facilitated, maybe if you have a class that has an opportunity to do that. But I think as an individual, the other thing you could do if you don't have that opportunity facilitated for you is to look to existing organizations in the community that might be, you know, interested in, in that sort of shared goal um, and see if they would you know, be able to help you do something like that. Um, so it's not just you like approaching random people. Um, but it's, it's a good question. Yeah. You're welcome. I think, unfortunately, we are out of time. time. So thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you all.